is that we'd best be wise enough between now and November 7 to forget all the game playing that he's been doing with us since 1946, in case you didn't know it began way back then, maybe before, but a public record then, but especially since 1968. Then we ought to just stand up and look at each other, just utter no words, see if there's really an honest gleam in the eyes of the person you're looking at. And if there is, just take that gleam as you've seen it and look quickly again at Richard Nixon. Now you've just had your test, and you can tell us, you can tell yourself, we can tell each other if he is for real. And if we find he is not, then take a look at George McGovern, not as your neighbor, not as the man that the press wants to have fumble, whom you have known here at home in South Dakota. Now just look at him the same way you've looked at Richard Nixon. You'll then know what to do on November 7. In the meantime, turn off the words in the games because we can win together with human compassion. Thank you. Lorne, President Ben, officers of this association, directors, and my South Dakota friends, I'm honored to have been asked to address this convention. I'm really in a fine spot after my friend Herrick Roth gave you this very great address this afternoon. This must be the Colorado part of the South Dakota Farmers Union program. I don't know how many of you know it, but uh, I am a South Dakotan, and my very first job that I ever took in my life after finishing school was with the South Dakota Farmers Union. It was supposed to be for three months. I got fired a hell of a lot of times, but from that day in June 1948, I worked for the Farmers Union in many capacities across the country for 16 consecutive years before uh, taking the job as executive director of Midwest Electric Consumers uh, Association with headquarters in Denver for the past eight years. Now we all remember that august leader of Britain during the first 50 years of this century. His name was Winston Churchill. And when he was prime minister during the war, Winston Churchill had successfully dodged an invitation to address the British Temperance Union. And finally, Sir Winston could no longer dodge the invitation to address the assembly of British non-drinkers. And dutifully, he appeared in a massive Victorian paneled great hall with a ceiling rising 100 feet toward the heavens, a very ornate Victorian place. And the, and the uh, president of the British Temperance Union introduced the great war leader and then said in his part of his introduction, of course I am ashamed to say that Sir Winston is a very heavy drinker. And holding out his hand, the president of the British Temperance Union said, I calculate that he has already drunk enough to fill this vast room up to here. And when Sir Winston finally got to the podium to address the British Temperance Union, he cast his eyes 100 feet, 94 feet, to that great ceiling and said, Dear God, still such a long way to go and so little time to do it in. I hope that you'll notice over here that the registration closes in South Dakota in a few days and there's lots of work for you to do. Lauren, I think, has described our association a little bit. We are terrifically interested. Let's keep the land in the hands of the people. And this is one of the issues that you face in this election year. It was Teddy Roosevelt who said, the conservation of our natural resources and their proper use constitute the fundamental problem which underlies almost every other problem of life. On February 10 of this year, the directors of Midwest Electric Consumers Association reconvened in special emergency session in Denver. At that time, they reaffirmed their opposition to the proposed principles and standards of the Nixon administration's proposal to raise the interest rates, the discount rates, and water projects. They directed me to make that opposition known to the Water Resources Council with all the force and vigor available to our association. We said in our testimony that the Nixon administration's proposed standards and procedures on this 7% interest rate represented disaster for the Missouri Basin, our rural region, and it represented disaster for the congested areas of the nation. 
In our testimony before the Water Resources Council, we noted that the seaboard states have more people and higher level of economic development than their resources can support. That is what is producing the social problems in the cities and polluted air, of dirty water, and too often unattractive living conditions. We also pointed out in our testimony that our region, the Missouri Basin, has underutilized resources and a declining economy. We noted that North and South Dakota have both lost population during the last de decade, as did the entire Missouri Basin, if you do not include three or four metropolitan areas. More people live in the District of Columbia than live in either North or South Dakota, and twice as many people live in Washington, D.C., as live in the entire state of Wyoming. We testified by stating that decisions to proceed or not to proceed with publicly financed projects and programs should be based on social and economic needs and not contrived economic evaluations from Wall Street. We said and we think we were on target when we pointed out that if Mr. Nixon's Office of Administration and Budget wanted to get caught up on going projects, they should tell the Congress and ask for a breather rather than the continuation of this administration's policy of no new starts, which is exactly what brought Midwest into existence in 1958 when Mr. Andel was in charge. If the administration wants to get over the hump on big projects, like Hawaii and Garrison, rather than stretching them out forever and thereby ballooning their costs enormously, they should say so, rather than for the White House and the Water Resources Council going through a lot of mumbo jumbo that no one understands, including the brightest of the water engineers among us. What we said in addition was that the new standards and procedures for water projects and the 7% interest was not only mumbo jumbo, but their effect was cosmetic, a deliberate effort to stop all water and reclamation projects. In this election year, I hope that you'll remember like Jim Patton was saying last night, that we need to be awfully careful in this country, and those in power and politicians need to be very careful, that we don't make the hurdles for development and survival so high that the poor among us can't make it. you damned right, that's what this election is all about, the poor and the underprivileged making it. Our association and the South Dakota Farmers Union are together concerned about what we term the energy crisis. We are desperately concerned about the proper development and use of this nation's fossil fuel reserves. And this afternoon, I am particularly anxious to discuss our concerns about the wise use of Rocky Mountain coal and Dakota lignite as an energy source of regional and interregional and national significance. With the inventory far from, from complete, we know that by weight, 55% of the national coal reserves are located in Montana, Wyoming, Colorado, and the two Dakotas. Most of this coal is low in sulfur content, and because of a highly favorable ratio between the thickness of the coal seams and the amount of overburden, most of the coal will need to be surface mined. Surface mining should reduce if it does not eliminate the problems associated with acid mine drainage, as they discovered too late in West Virginia. But surface mining makes attention to land reclamation after mining a matter of urgent importance. Now, if for environmental reasons and proper ones, we are unable to utilize solid fuels with high sulfur content, the five state resources I have enumerated become an even more important proportion of the nation's total energy reserves. As a nation, we have committed much of our talent and huge sums of money to the use of the atom as a source of energy for electric power supply. Even then, in view of the urgency of the energy crisis, it may be that we have been too stingy. In any event, Midwest is completely convinced that our commitment of both talent and dollars to the proper utilization and development and management of our low sulfur solid fuel resources is grossly inadequate both as compared to the investment in the nuclear program and our national needs. 
In this election year, we must communicate to our political leaders and our would-be political leaders that a significant portion of these Western coals are located on lands that are owned or administered in trusteeship by the Department of the Interior. Much of this valuable resource is owned by you, the people, all the people of the United States. And you need to know in this meeting here today, and I hope you will com communicate it to your neighbors, as owners of these resources, and your future wholesale power supply depends upon it, that the Department of Interior has been transferring these tremendously valuable resources of unlimited national sig significance to private ownership without any discernible, discernible evidence that any consideration whatsoever has been given to the national interest or to the public good. While reporting to my membership in De Denver in December of 1971, I chastised the Bureau of Reclamation for spe spending substantial sums of money developing pipeline schemes to bring water to the coal fields for the obvious benefit of the energy companies that are rapidly extending their monopoly control to the coal resources and public lands. Nine months later, I see no evidence that the Department of the Interior in the Nixon administration even begins to comprehend the reasons for our concern. Obviously, with this administration's special interest programs, they are convinced that whatever is good for Gulf oil is good enough for the country. So I believe the Nixon administration's policy with respect to energy sources on public lands must be reversed and reversed immediately. Together we must contend that coal land leasing should be terminated and water diversion studies interrupted until the Department of the Interior has developed a public interest program for the use of these resources and discuss their proposals in the light of day with our representatives in the Congress and through them with the people of the United States. A public interest program, a public interest program must, must secure maximum benefit for the public from the, from the resources in public ownership. Development of the resources must be achieved on a basis that is environmentally acceptable and the sale of mineral leases on public lands must require stringent land restoration clauses. Now, in a related area, we need to put more money into research to get the most use out of coal and be able to use, save as much land as we can in this energy crisis. We need funding for magnetohydrodynamics. We need research into combined cycles of fuel cells. We need funding for these programs and not just pious words coming from the White House concerning research and development. Now, in my annual report to our membership nine months ago, I underscored the deteriorating relationship between the Bureau of Reclamation and the Department of Interior. I noted that the failure of the Bureau of Reclamation personnel to deal openly and candidly with their constituents and customers was the major cause of distrust and misgivings. Nine months ago, my concern was related to a strong suspicion that the Department of Interior was dealing with matters of grave concern to the publicly owned electric utilities, the REAs that Lawrence Zingmark and East River represent here, and your distribution cooperatives, because they were withholding in information, I suspected, about those dealings with the utilities and not letting the people know. Unfortunately, I wish I could tell you that I had been overly suspicious on December 8. It has now been established that the truth was infinitely worse than we had guessed in late 1971. Stated as clearly as I can to you, the Nixon administration's move to place the Bureau of Reclamation in the Mid-Continent Area Power Pool is the reality of a new alliance between the Nixon administration and private power monopolists to subvert, to give away the federal system to take it away from you, the people. Now, we are for power pools. We're for real power pools. Midwest Electric Consumers Association believes that a soundly conceived region-wide and nationwide power pooling is absolutely essential if our resources are going to be used, utilized wisely in meeting our growing energy needs. The need for a free-flowing pool transmission system 
and optimum use of available generation is particularly urgent in the current electric power supply crisis. With the need for real power pooling so essential, both for the economic good of the region where we live and the country, a group of utilities dominated by Northern States Power Company have developed what they have chosen to call a power pool. It is not a pool. The arrangements that would be established by the MAP, MAP document makes no provisions for joint ownership of generation and does not in any sense of the word establish a free-flowing region-wide transmission network. It excludes East River. It excludes, excludes the G&T of Rushmore. The small consumer-owned utilities that need power pooling with the greatest urgency are excluded from participation and many slightly larger utilities can become associate members, which permits them to pay dues for the support of Northern States Power Company personnel to run everything, but confers no benefits or no participation in the decision-making process whatsoever on the utility paying the dues. Now that's a first-class con operation if you can get away with it. The proposed MAP pool is not in the public interest. It will not alleviate the energy crisis. On the contrary, it will aggravate the situation for hundreds of small utilities in our nine-state region. Now, incongruous as it may seem, instead of objecting to the MAP pool by using its obvious leadership to improve the document, the Department of the Interior under Roger C.B. Morton from the East Shore of Maryland and his Assistant Secretary James Smith, formerly of South Dakota, from Northern Natural Gas committed the Bureau of Reclamation to affiliation with that pool unilaterally. And I am proud that the South Dakota Farmers Union and the National Farmers Union and many towns and cities in South Dakota, including your G&T in this eastern part of the state, East River, joined us in the petition to the Federal Power Commission to hear the case and either reject the map pool or modify it substantially to make it a real pool. We are dismayed, and you should be dismayed, that the actions of the Department of Interior in this administration shamefully abuse the public interest. And we are dismayed, and you should be dismayed, that the managers of the Department of Interior, the Nixon appointees, have gro grossly abused their public trust. Now, I hope you'll be glad to hear, even though the FPC has accepted the map pooling agreement as a new rate schedule to go into effect on December 1 of this year, that we have as interveners been granted a hearing. It's a hearing after the election. Frankly, I feel that this case in which you are involved violates existing contracts and places the Department of Interior in violation of the Federal Power Act and antitrust statutes, and it'll probably wind up in the courts after Labor Day next year. Now, years ago, Leland Olds, a distinguished former chairman of the Federal Power Commission under two administrations, advanced what he called the giant power concept. Olds correctly identified the rapid emergence of the economies of scale. He was committed, as we are, to what we call a pluralistic electric system. But we need to remember that the essence of his proposal was that generation and transmission should be separated from distribution in the electric power industry. Under his concept, separate generation and transmission organizations would provide bulk electric power to local utilities that would continue to be responsible for distribution and marketing. Of course, private electric utility management, which seems to me to be a sort of a combination between the 17th century economists and the 18th century bureaucrats, summarily rejected Leold's idea out of hand, as they reject all new ideas. But Lee Olds is now receiving renewed attention because of organization like, organizations like ours, and we find his ideas more attractive than ever. The National Power Survey included among its findings a conclusion that we can expect great savings from integrated planning, construction and operation of generation and transmission facilities on a regional basis. Subsequent experience, however, has suggested that there is little hope that such arrangements can be made under existing patterns of ownership and control. It could be accomplished almost by definition through the giant power concept. 
the economies of scale, the building of the big plants, and jointly by, by joint ownership. Suggested by Olds also applies to pollution control techniques. And by definition again, a number of small plants will create more total pollution than a few large ones at any given level of anti-pollution technology. And larger enterprises can incorporate the latest technology at the lowest cost per unit of power. It is a travesty that this nation has no national grid system to interlink power short areas with potential sources of, su of surplus supply elsewhere. The issue was highlighted in 1969 when Basin Electric up in North Dakota offered power to Consolidated Edison, which did not have enough power to meet consumer demand in New York. And Con Ed had to reject the offer because the interconnections were too small to handle the load. And so the National Grid Bill, introduced by Senator McGovern and Metcalf, Congressman Aberisk, Tiernan of Rhode Island, and Badillo of New York, is the logical and appropriate method for securing bulk power supply at the lowest possible cost, at the highest standards of reliability with minimum damage to the environment. In my opinion, the existing institutions of the electric utility area, primarily the investor-owned utilities upon whom consumers depend for 85% of this nation's power supply, have failed and are failing as they failed in the 1920s. In fact, in our region, you well know, rural electrification was very late in arrival, and it still would not be accomplished if we had not put together three basic ingredients. And the Farmers Union made a great contribution in the area of, of uh, turning the lights on on the farms of this state and this region. And those ideas in the Farmers Union was a nonprofit operations the cooperative principles of one member, one vote, the idea of people banding together and organizing together with those $5 memberships to provide a service that you desperately needed. We also had to put together another part of this, which was the 2% REA loan program, which we still need more and more inadequate funding. And finally, you had to have reasonably priced wholesale power, meaning the Fort Peck Dam, and the Flood Control Act of 1944. And you folks made a great contribution to that. But you will recall that in the early 1930s, when the existing institutions, the private utilities had failed, this new application of cooperative principles was initiated with the Farmers Union help from a sympathetic Congress and an understanding national administration. That's what led to the rural electrification program and the work of Franklin Roosevelt and George Norris has made rural electrification one of the great American success stories. It was a period of the resurgence of municipal systems and public utility districts, and significantly for you folks in this area, where the REA cooperatives have been permitted to develop their own sources of supply, bulk power supplies are adequate for six or seven years. So I think the time has come when we must assert the same kind of leadership we saw in the 1930s, this time for consumers in all parts of the country. But the kind of leadership we get, my friends, is determined at elections. My friends, the private power monopoly in conjunction with this special interest administration has the foundations laid for the most colossal giveaway in all of American history. What is being given away is not only the people's resources, the land, but the right of the people to choose public or cooperative electric service. And this is a fundamental right, an American right which more than any other single factor has served as a check on private monopoly in the public service field. The Power Trust now dominates REA and the REA administrator. It dominates the Federal Power Commission. It dominates the Atomic Energy Commission. It dominates the Department of the Interior, the Department of Agriculture, the Bureau of Reclamation. And they are not moving slowly while those charged with the public interest in Washington double talk about government economy and federal encroachment. That's talk to lull the people to sleep 
while rape is in progress of the programs you have built and rape of your resources and the rape is the objective and don't you forget it. You can tell the priorities of an administration by the money it impounds in the last four years. The money impounded on the 2% loan program, the low cost housing program for rural America, of the impoundment of the money for food stamps, of rural water and sewer systems, and of roads and land and water conservation funds. President Nixon on Saturday morning is putting pressure on the Congress to put $250 billion ceiling on government spending. This convention should protest that to your congressman from here in South Dakota this week because it means an end, if enacted, to the public interest programs and the negation of your program of policy and action. It was Lee Olds who warned us of a private monopoly, government partnership, as the greatest threat of all to democracy itself, the threat that democracy itself will be undermined by an all-powerful private energy resources dictatorship dominated by Wall Street, reaching into every urban and rural community with unlimited funds to spend on propaganda, using television and radio and the printed page and every other form of communication to mold and brainwash public opinion. And so I think it is very important, if we're going to check monopoly in the energy and electric field, that we use our enlightened political strength. When we talk about the things that we need, when we talk about the things that we want to do, then if we really mean it, we must do what we have rarely done in the past, and that is to be concerned enough about what happens in elections. Now, we just don't happen to have Democrat and Republican majorities in this country. We do have a two-party system, obviously, but it is really a liberal coalition and a conservative coalition. But we have a more important coalition represented on this program this afternoon. It's the coalition of people, of public power groups, of organized labor, of consumers organizing in large cities, of farm organizations, the farmers union, of church groups, and we have minorities that can be on our side. And I believe that if you support the programs for people, as all of us here, I hope, support the programs for people and your neighbors, then we must of necessity support the independent positions of each part of the coalition that gives us the majority of the whole. Either we're going to do this, or we will go back to our isolated individual segment of society, and to do so simply means that we will be overwhelmed by that conservative reactionary coalition which doesn't hesitate to work together on, together on issues of private interests, private investments, and private greed. I think we have the responsibility and the know-how to solve the energy crisis and most of our problems. It will be solved by dedicated people who are the foundations of this program. We know the problems and we do have sound solutions. Two weeks ago today, at Billings, Montana, was held a great coalition consisting of the Farmers Union, organized labor, church groups, rural electric groups, the American Public Power Association, the National Rural Electric Cooperative Association, and others. It was a great parallel meeting at Billings of Western States Water and Power Consumers Conference with 1960. At that 1960 conference, the folks who attended heard John F. Kennedy campaigning for the presidency set forth his program for the wise use of America's resources. He told us in that meeting in 1960 that he would reverse the No New Starts policy, and he did it. He said he would appoint to the regulatory commissions, the REA and the Interior Department, men who would put the public interest first, and he did it. He said he would step up the fight against pollution, water pollution, air pollution, and he did it. He said he would commit his administration to adherence to the preference clause, which, which enables the small city-owned and consumer-owned power systems to stay in business and keep a few companies from completely dominating the energy field, and he did it. He said he would apply the scientific talents and energies of government to resource development, and he did it. 
And two weeks ago today, your senator, George McGovern, told us that he would do all those things, and he will. <laughs> senator McGovern also told us that he would force the development of a coordinated public interest policy for management of public resources so that environmental factors will be considered, and he will. And Senator McGovern said that to this great public meeting of 17 reclamation states, said he would urge the enactment of national grid legislation, legislation and he will. And let me tell you what we also invited to that meeting the President of the United States, he couldn't come. We invited the Vice President, and he did not even have the courtesy to answer. So our challenge is to get understanding of these matters among people. And it seems to me that the time has come in South Dakota again to do what you know you have to do. This is no time for a certain kind of amiable shiftlessness in the face of fraud and deceit and immorality. You've got money in your pockets, and where you spend the money, I was taught in the Farmers Union, is where you express your philosophy. You can do something to elect people to George McGovern to the presidency of the United States, and you need to get going up and down the section roads to do it. As members of other organizations, the rural electric cooperatives, Let's get those boards of directors and managers mobilized in a fight for the survival of people on the land. You've got your elevators, and you've got your oil companies, and you've got your insurance programs and agents. You've got force, but you're never going to win this thing without getting out and working. They may have $35 million on top of the table, but you've got your neighbors, and you know what your problems are, and I hope that you're going to do it, because this is a year of decision, and it's your land. John? I hope you all know.